Okay everyone, welcome to Kairos, a tutorial introduction. What I'm going to do is show you how we can use Kairos at the early stages of software design. There's not a lot of knowledge about how to actually address security in the earlier stages of, of design, but we've been doing some research in this space for a few years, and we've encapsulated research on how to do that into Kairos itself. One of the key themes of this tutorial, and for Kairos in general, is that software isn't sec secure if it's not usable. And this is something that needs to be done at the early stages of, of, of design too. So this is really a tutorial approach on how to do that as much as it is on using Kairos. So what we're going to give you is a quick motivation about why you should care, talk about some of the key topics around security and just enough uh, security. And then we're going to focus a bit on requirements and how risk analysis can help us outline initial de design, get at some security requirements and some potential design elements. Um, now this meme here pretty much summarizes the state of the nation when it comes to building security into product uh, design. Despite the rhetoric and even uh, legislation, security is typically boiled, bolted onto a design of any product or service. No one really wants to intentionally make this an afterthought, but people are going to focus on innovation, which means that building security in is in most cases just a platitude. And part of the problem is that no one really knows what it looks like to build security into the design of a software or, 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 or product. Um, if security was built in, what we should have is some means of, of carrying out or at least demonstrating the design assurance. And the need for that assurance should, should be, should be self-evident. If we have a product that we say is secure, it's because it conforms to some form of specification. And that's our basis of assurance. And that's not really shocking to anyone that comes from a system engineering or so safety engineering background. Um, but the thing is, even that doesn't say much about where the specification itself actually came from and the assumptions that went into the spec. Now, in the harder engineering uh, d -d -d disciplines, the thing that's being assur assured is tangible. So a car, a bridge, etc. you can actually see it. Um, not so much for, for, for software. I mean, as Frederick Brooks Jr. said, you know, software is an invisible castle built in the air for, for, from air. And it's easy to forget that assurance is needed for the work that goes into the specifications. So even in classic software engineering, there's, there's a strong focus on specification and modeling, but not so much on where these specs and models actually come from. Now, if you focus too much on specs, you get, you know, what was traditionally called analysis paralysis. And you're never going to get anything signed off. And that was really the motivation for all the agile work that happened at the, at the start of the, of the millennium. Approaches like XP, Scrum, etc. Et Philosophy was always, if you've got a good, few good developers, some solid tools, and you care a bit about code quality, then you should value code over documentation. So what would happen is the design would become manifest within the code itself. Um, the problem is, though, number one, Code is too granular to spot all design problems, particularly if the code base is big. Number two, you know, way back in 2000, code, rather software, was only deployed to a limited number of platforms, but, but software is just now everywhere. You've got a mixture of old and new, and software isn't just an app. It could be infrastructure, operating systems, even application frameworks, and they're deployed from everything to desktops, to sensors, to even MRIs. Um, you might also have design in configuration and design in other artifacts too. The third problem is that not everyone wants to or can actually re 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 read code. So if all your design is in the code, you're going to have problems when it comes to providing assurance. Um, now, in parallel to all this, there's been this growing recognition that um, for security or for secure software, security is necessary, but, 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 but not sufficient. And security is meaningless if it doesn't fit the context of use. And we don't know what that is without understanding who our users are, what their goals are, what tasks they carry out, and what context where technology is used. Now, to establish what these contexts of use are, we need more than just user experience um, design uh, techniques. We need a little bit of assurance as well, because people are going to want to know what the basis of a goal, what the basis of a task might, might be. Um, and we need to do this because these could also be the origin of security problems as well. And so there's a lot of research that is useful for building things like task descriptions, descriptions of people, can be good for finding possible threats and attacks as well. So the, the earlier we can start thinking about usability, the more it can help us, for um, it can help us when it comes to security as well. 
Um, the thing is, though, the, this sort of design takes time. As much as we need uh, the design, we also need to remember that the pur purpose of most product or software design interventions is to make people and processes more uh, productive. Security is actually a secondary concern, and people want the value. So for that reason, we can't really sacrifice uh, agility because people want software faster, quicker, etc. Um, so that, that can be problem. That can be problematic because data is a data, design is a data driven activity. And if we care about design assurance, then we need to care about taking our time. Um, now, even if we did all that, we would hit a number of other problems as well. Um, one of these problems is, is kind of sum, summarized by something called the bounded rationality bias, which says that design, the decision making is going to be limited by the rationality of individuals, the information they have availability, and the cognitive, li li and cognitive lim limitations. Now, what this means in terms of design is that early stage design models are only going to get so big. They're only going to get so uh, non-trivial. Non and sooner or later, when designs start to get big and messy, people are going to fall back on, on stereotypes because they don't have the information limitations time to do anything anything otherwise. And at this point, people might say quite rationally, well, what's the whole point? Why don't I just go, go, go back to code? Because at least if I'm coding, I'm making sense of, of the design. So what that means is that we actually need tools that are going to support the elicitation analysis and management of design models, given these, uh, the, these limitations. And we can't validate a design if we can't reason about the analysis that goes into the decision itself. Um, now, even if we had these tools, what would a tool actually look like? Because uh, the thing is, practitioners have never really had the sort of tools that they would need. Uh, and it's hard finding the basis of a tool because of this whole idea that the cobbler's children have, 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 have no shoes. And what we mean by that is that if you look at the tools that people use to come up with software re requirements, the most common tools out there are things like word processors and Excel. Um, so state-of-the-art hasn't really moved on that much. If we think about security, we typically think in terms of risk management tools. Uh, if you think about HCI, it's traditionally a craft-based uh, discipline, so we fall back on whiteboards, post-it notes, and perhaps tools for doing in interface um, design. Now, that's not actually a problem in itself. Um, but it but it kind of raised the question that if we really want to do security by design, if we really care about design assurance and, and, and models, what is the solution going to be? Um, so one idea is to think back to these problems that led to analysis uh, per paralysis that motivated Agile in the first place. Because the perception was that collecting, modeling and reasoning about models at the early stage of design took time. But what if we cut the time it took to actually specify and analyze the data co uh, collected? Um, what if we could get design insights as the data is collected? What if we could draw new insights as data is added and make it easy for other people to collaborate and feedback sooner? So the solution is some form of collaborative tool support. And that was really the motivation for Kairos, uh, which stands for Computer Aid Integration of Requirements Information Security. Now, what Kairos is, is a software as a service platform for building security and usability into your software. So the purpose of this tutorial is to give you just enough Kairos or just enough background on Kairos and its principles so you can start doing some tool supported early, early stage design. Now, Kairos itself is released under an Apache software license. Code is free to use and extend. A good way of finding out how Kairos works is, is not just going through the tutorials and the books that I lead reading I'll talk about at the end, but also just to dig into the code to figure out what's going on. Um, if you do have questions, problems, requests about Kairos, it's a good idea to always raise an issue in GitHub in the Kairos repository itself. Um, so what I'm going to cover in, in this tutorial are some of the key principles behind Kairos and I'll talk a little bit about installation and deployment options. I want to talk about how we can develop what I call assured uh, personas and tasks and help you start modeling the context of use that these guys are live in. We'll talk a bit about modeling requirements, risks, and countermeasures, and how you can go from these UX artifacts to some form of very early stage design. I'll talk a little bit about documentation and interoperability so you can see what the outputs are. And I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about how we've used Kairos in the real world. Um, these are a few things that I'm not going to cover. 
I'm not going to talk too much about what these things are, other than other than to say that in the Kairos documentation, you can find all sorts of information on, on these topics. And it may well be the topic of a future tutorial. Um, now, in terms of where Kairos came from, it was really a prototype tool for requirements and risk management that fell off the back of some PhD research I did uh, between 2008 and 2011. And we designed a prototype tool to support um, requirements and risk management for a course that we were running at Oxford. And when I started developing the tool, I was kind of a bit surprised that people were taking so long to build something. So I said, I'll just knock something up. How long could it possibly take? And I guess the fact it's taken 10 years can tell you something a little bit about um, how complex a problem tool support for this form of design actually is. Um, we first presented a prototype of this tool back at the RE conference in, uh, in 2009. And we released the code itself under an open source license in, 2000 and, um, in, in 2012, not 2002 as it says on the slides. Um, in recent years, what's happened, Keras has evolved from a desktop application, which was a little bit of a pig to install, to a cloud platform. Uh, where the installation process and the UI is, is a little, little bit smoother. And over the years, although the core algorithms of Keras haven't changed uh, the, 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 that, that much, um, the core architecture hasn't changed significantly. A lot of the technology has. And what's happened is that over the years, as more and more people have used it, the stability has actually improved significantly. Um, so there are a number of key principles that are useful to understand if you're going to use Keras. Um, the first principle is this idea of environments as a first, for first, for first class object. So when you build some software, you build it for some sort of context of use. Um, so one of the principles of Kairos is that environments are things that you create, and most objects will have environment-specific properties. And we'll see an example of that when we talk about um, 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 assets, and the idea that assets could have some value in an environment and some different in value in another environment. If you could reason about this, we might find some interesting things that we might not otherwise consider if we just thought of a, of a system um, being developed for a sunny day environment. Um, the second principle is that you don't really have to do things in any particular order. Now that's not entirely correct because some things do need to be specified uh, before others. So anything that's environment specific means that you need to specify environments first. But other than that, you can start adding assets add, and, uh, and add other things and then add more assets. And as you modify an asset, you don't have to go and tweak all the things that necessarily d d depend on it. The innovation is how everything is linked, not in the order in, in which you add data. Um, the third principle is that the more you add to Keras, the, the, more, the, the, the more value you get. So Keras will visualize things as, as it goes along. It will validate things as it, as it goes along. And what this will mean is it'll help you make, make sense of the model and overcome this boundary rationality bias I talked about. Finally, Keras was designed to be in, 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 interoperable. Um, we designed the model formats to be easy to exchange with, with other people. We have APIs to make it easy to integrate Keras in, in, into, in, into, into your tool chain because we never said that Keras was going to be the one tool that, 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 that fits all. Uh, now, in terms of installing Keras, uh, you've got two, two options. One is to use some pre-built Docker, the, the, the Docker containers. So you can just download and run these on any machine that will run Docker. We have a live demo on demo.caris.org. That's actually based on, 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 on Docker. So if you want to go to GitHub, have a look at how these things are, are created because Docker containers are built every time code is pushed to the master branch of the Kairos uh, repository. You can have a look at the Docker file and basically build your own containers for your own environment. The second option is what I call a, a, a source ins installation, which is getting Kairos directly for, uh, from the sources and just installing it on your, on your own, um, typically li li Linux environment. Now, this used to be something of a pain, but we now have a quick install script such that if you um, have a, something like an Ubuntu VM, you can literally install um, Kairos and all its dependencies and configure it in just a single line. Um, which is great. Um, for more information on, on installation, have a look at the documentation. Now, if you're going to deploy Kairos, you've, there are a number of, of typical deployments. So if, you, if you're de deploying to a, to a cloud, your deployment diagram might look a little bit like this. So you have your laptop and a web browser. 
The Kairos UI application is literally just some collection of JavaScript, CSS, and, and HTML that will be downloaded when you talk to your server. Um, you're talking typically to a container that might be running on some sort of cloud host machine, and that will talk to some other containers. Uh, now, if you want to deploy locally, but on Docker, things are pretty much the, 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 the same. The only difference is everything is actually on the, on the, on the, on the, on the same machine. Um, I guess your third option is what I would call a development configuration. So in this case, there are a few differences. The first difference is that the DEM is that the Kairos services, what I call Kairos D, and the database are all running on, 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 on a single machine. And that's what you need to point your, your web browser to. So if you've got a virtual machine, you need to know what the IP address is because your web, web browser needs to actually uh, point, point to it. Um, there is a Kairos configuration file. And that will that will point to where the the database actually lives and lives and and a few other bits and pieces. Now, as I said, this used to be a fairly painful, fain, painful process. But it, but if you look at the documentation, there is now literally a one line command that you can run, which will do everything for you and demonize the Kairos daemon. So every time you restart your virtual machine, you've got a Kairos daemon ready for you to work with. So if you have a clean VM, just run the command, uh, go get a coffee, but by, by, by the time you get back, you should be all set. Um, I should say a little bit about Kairos models, because if you're creating something, sooner or later, you're going to want to save what you've got. Now, to do that in Kairos, you need to export your model, and then when you want to load it, you want to re-import -re it. Now, Kairos model files are fundamentally just um, XML. A little bit like what we see on what we see on, on the slide. Um, so if you really want to manually edit them, if you want a version control, it's pretty easy because it's just it's just ASCII text. The models themselves conform to an XML DTD, and what that means is that um, we can do a certain amount of syntactic and semantic validation on the file before Kairos even sees it. Now, in addition to importing Kairos model files, we also have this idea of model packages. Now, what these are, are just zip archives which have models and images. So there will be a single Kairos model, but certain things like security patterns, architectural patterns, which admittedly I'm not talking about in this tutorial, don't live in kind Kairos models. Similarly, if you can upload images for certain um, objects like personas and attackers. Um, these have to live somewhere as well. Um, so, so a dot Kairos file is effectively a zip archive with all, all of these different things. So when you import a Kairos model, models are stored in individual um, databases. Um, every user on a, on, a, on a Kairos installation will have a default database, but users can create other databases as well. And these databases can be shared with other users which have accounts on the, on the same server. So that can be quite nice if you want to share share work you're doing, but you don't want to give people your authentication details. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the first of the important key concept in Kairos, which is the uh, the environment. Now, these are the context that the systems operate in. They could be physical environments, social environments. It could even be based on things like time um, time of day busy session, not so busy session, etc. Um, the idea is if we have Environments as a first class object, thinking about context and how things fit in the context use will give us ideas when it comes to security and then usability. So I might want to design for a task that might take longer during the day than at night. Similarly, there might be certain attackers at night that might not that we might not have to worry about during during the day. Um, okay. So this is what environments look like in Kairos. So you can access environments from the UX environment menus. Environments need a name, a short code, a description. Don't worry too much about this environment table at the bottom of the screen. One of the things you can do in Kairos, but you may not need to do very often, is actually specify composite environments. So these are environments that contain other environments. Um, one of the benefits this might have is that if you have an asset which, for which exists in multiple environments but has, has different security properties, you might want to say, well, this is going to be the overriding environment, or I want to see what the most serious property is across all the environments. So the idea of creating a composite environment is that you can see that. Um, but I really wouldn't worry too much about it, though, because I've seen very few, although we, we have this feature in Karis, there have been very few situations where anyone has actually needed to use it. 
Um, the other key concept, or another key concept in Keras, is this idea of assets. So these are the objects that are being safeguarded by a system being specified. So these are the things of value. We're specifying our system because we want to create assets or we want to use assets in some way. So assets could be information, software, hardware, um, usually things that, that are, are tangible. Um, they will have environment-specific security and privacy properties, things like confidentiality, integrity, availability, anonymity, uh, etc. And what we can do in Kairos is that we can create models of assets, which are based on UML class diagrams, which can help us understand how assets uh, relate to each other. And we can also relate assets to other objects as well, that we'll, as we'll see later. So to understand why, we, why assets and environments are useful, let's think of a simple example. We have an unnamed person who's keeping some commercially sensitive information on a USB stick that he wants to take home because he might want to work from home. Um, this guy has attended security. We're in a seminar and he's now hypersensitive about the information he has on the USB stick. And he says, well, the confidentiality of what's on here is really important. And I, I'm responsible, so accountability is also very important as well. Now, if it's 6 p.m. and he's running from train, all he's thinking about is, I really need the information on, on this USB stick. So his focus is gonna be on productivity. Productivity, usability, when we care about that, we usually care about availability uh, as a property. Now, once he's finished his work and he's on the way, and he's on the on the way on the way back to the office on Monday, um, he might care a bit about productivity, but not but not so much. But if there was an opportunist opportunistic attacker, he or she might might care about the availability of of, of that information as well. He's not the attacker is not necessarily going to want to go all out to get this information, but if the opportunity is there he'll take, take advantage of it. So these could be shared availability uh, properties, uh, properties in the sense that the attacker has got an interest in the availability of the information on the USB stick and so is the person that has been working on it. So in these situations, it's the same, it's the same asset, but the contexts have been different. Um, so when we define assets in the risk um, assets menu. Um, assets need a name, a short code, and a type. So the, the types are particularly important if we're doing data flow diagrams because entities and data stores are different types of assets. Uh, they need a description, some indication of the, of the significance, but there are also a number of environment specific properties. So the security properties. So in the case of a programmable logic controller, we care about people not, not tampering with these things because it might impact the bit of uh, the 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 bit of um, the thing that's critical, which which is controlling, but we also care about its availability as well because it's actually controlling um, the, the machinery. Um, we're not going to look at the criticality and interfaces tab because it's not they're not really too important for this tutorial. The criticality tab um, is useful to know because sometimes people set that and then they look at the risk analysis models and they wonder why the risks are so high. So the idea of, of criticality is if you set an asset as critical, then any risk associated with that asset is automatically going to be given the highest possible um, rating. So this is a feature that we added because people said that actually we have certain assets that are so important that if anything vaguely bad touches it, we really, really want to know about it. The problem of using this, though, is that it kind of throws this idea of risk analysis or rational risk analysis or, or, um, um, out the window. So when you, when you are setting that criticality tab, you need to give some ind indication about why it's so critical. Um, if you are creating assets, you might want to, as I said, create associations between them as well. You can do that by the risks um, asset associations menu. So asset associations are really based on UML class diagrams. So your heads um, on both sides here will be will be the assets. Nav is navigability, and these and the types will be the type of associations. So associations, compositions, or aggregations. Enery is saying something about the multi the, uh, the 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 mul the multiplicity. Now you can create assets here, so create asset associations here. But within the asset association itself, you can also create associations if the asset is actually the head of of of, of the head of, of the relationship uh, personally i tend to create them within the asset the within the asset associations menu so i don't get confused about which end of the relationship an, an asset is um, as you define them uh, you can use the asset model in the models um, accessible from the models menu to actually view the emerging asset model so as i say this is environment specific so during the day 
Um, these are the these are how assets re relate to each other. So the stick figures of personas, we'll talk about them in a second. Um, if we have a relationship between the stick figure and asset, it means there's a task that's being defined where this asset's being used. The shade of the assets is based on the attack surface. Now that's based on the number of vulnerabilities and the criticality of the vulnerabilities associated with, with the asset. So if you see things, assets that are dark red, it means that a lot of this is that this asset is is could potentially be exploitable uh, by a number of different ways. So this is something that can help focus attention. Um, now, in that previous slide, we filtered a lot of concerns, but if we start adding um, associations between tasks, goals, etc., what we start seeing are these blue comment nodes. Usually, you, you're going to want to hide concerns, but sometimes if you've got small focus models, it can be useful to see, without going into, into another model, um, how an asset is, is being used elsewhere. Um, okay, I'll talk a little bit about some of the key usability concepts um, in Kairos. Um, so we have this idea of tasks, tasks for activities that people need to achieve a goal. And we have this idea of personas, which are specifications of archetypical users. Um, tasks describe scenarios that are specific to environments where personas are carrying out some work, and that work might entail using assets. When we specify these scenarios, they might have a duration, um, a frequency, some indication of how demanding the persona finds it, and some indication of where there are any persona goals conflict with, with, with the system goals. And these map to ISO 924111 um, usability goals. And we might have um, multiple goals, depending on the environments that a single task might, 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 might be carried out. So there's just enough information here to capture the basics of, of context of use. Um, now, personas themselves are an important concept in, in Kairos. And what these are are models of archetypical users where these models are just descriptive text. Um, now, the reason personas can be useful is that if, you've, if you're designing systems for a person, the person that you're designing system for, you may never have met, or they may not be particularly easy to, 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 uh, to, to get hold of. Um, even if you do interview them, to sort of understand a little bit more about what they do and what they want from, from the system. If all you've got are interview transcripts, it's very hard to actually make, make sense of that. So the idea of the persona then is, is that it is a model that you create from analyzing this, this qualitative data, which is collected from observations or some form of user research that you've actually carried out. And because it's a, it, is, it, it is a specification, because it's based on real data, it's a means of incorporating user research into security decision making. So we're not building personas because they're cute, because they, they, they look nice. We're building them because these are these are important stakeholders in, in, in our design. And if people say, why are we, why are these requirements the way they are? It may well be because we have to go back to goals that the, that the personas have. Um, before we can define a persona, you also need to define that the roles that persona is carried out. So roles are just abstractions of people or, or even machines. We're not going to talk about use cases in, in this tutorial, but you can create use cases in Kairos. And when you do, the use case actors are, are, are typically roles. When we talk about defining goals, you can define responsibility relationships. So who is responsible for a certain system goal? And the, the person that is responsible would be a role rather than, than a persona. Because so roles are things the systems are, are, are designed for. Now, when we're defining a persona itself, which we do via the UX personas menu, personas need a name, a type, and some narrative text for activities, attitudes, aptitudes, etc. So these are just behavioral aspects of the persona. There are also a few environments for specific properties. So if the, if the, if the persona directly uses the, the system being, being designed, you would tick the direct user box. And also indicate the roles specific to to environments. And if there's something, if there's an narrative information which is, which is environment specific, you would put this here. But the thing about personas is you don't just type, you don't just type the the the, the map. Um, you have to actually ca um, ca carry, out, carry out research. And a lot of people use personas thinking they can just write down what's in their head in their heads. That's not correct. You need to collect data, analyze data, and really show how this and how this analysis is it is informing the, the the patterns and the patterns of data that you find are encapsulated in, in, in your persona description so again personas are models not merely just narrative text 
So if you're going to build build persona, you need to grow and collect data from from representative context of use. I usually tell people that I would want to go for a minimum of three interviews for every every for, for every persona I might want, 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 want to create. I might interview people, observe people, but sooner or later I'm going to have a pile of transcripts or a pile of notes. I need to turn this in, in, in into a persona. So what do I do? Well, what I want to do is code this data to try and find what we call factoid statements which are true or false. So these might be phrases or concepts that I find. So here's some examples, standalone stargate, hack and indifference, engineer only infection. So these are things that these are these are very, very short phases that I've drawn from sentences that people have said or things that are being inferred. So they may be true, they may be false, but these are these are statements. And what we do is when we have a, enough of these, we can move them around and group them. So these particular factoids group under this hacking and likely uh, category. And I be able to want, want to write some text about this. So here's some example of some narrative that really puts in context this, this affinity diagram, or rather this part of an affinity diagram. Um, so we, we have some verbatim comments here. The only way the SCADA will get affected is by instrument tech plugin virus infected laptop in, in, into it. So I actually got that particular verbatim comment from, from, from one, one, one of the transcripts related to, to the factoids. Um, the problem with personas for security, though, is that the people that tend to create personas can internalize them in ways that other people can't. Um, and so what often happens is the people that are using the personas are the same people that, that, that actually uh, cook, uh, cook, create them. And a lot of other people that use them don't use them in the same way. The other problem is that personas can become a weak link when challenging security decision making. So if someone's not happy about a requirement or how we might address a risk, they may not challenge the requirement of the risk. They may challenge the persona instead because that's the basis upon which all, all that design takes place. So as soon as people start doing that, remembering the whole role of design assurance, um, the whole legitimacy of everything that persona is going to be based on is called in, in, into question. So it'd be quite nice if we can provide some rationale for the work that went into persona, but doing so in such a way that we can preserve the, 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 the anonymity of people that we, we might have interviewed. So one means of doing that is this, um, a, is this approach which we call Toolman models, or rather Toolman's model of argumentation. So it's really a means of visualizing an argument. And in a way, we might say that some aspect of a persona could be an argument based on data we're making. So let's imagine we've got this, got this claim. Anne is, is a, a, a redhead. We might have some grounds for that claim. So Anne is one of, one of Jack's sisters, so Anne is, is a redhead. I might have something that bridges the grounds to the claim, so something that connects these two together. So Anne is one of Jack's sisters, and because Jack's sisters are taken to have red hair, then, then Anne is a redhead. And that, that might sound reasonable, and the backing for that warrant is that all Jack's sisters were observed to have red hair. Now, actually, if you think about this a little bit more, you might say, well, hold on. Um, you know, presumably, this is the case. But what if we find out Anne has actually got dyed hair? And, and that would be uh, a, a rebuttal to, 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 to the argument. So this is really a way of, vis of very quickly visualizing a claim. And what we can do is that we can actually come up with a means of structuring persona characteristics based on exactly, a, on exactly the same model. Um, and this is what it looks like. So we can take our original grouping of factoids, say the category name is a characteristic, uh, the ground is that the grounds are hacking and difference engine infection, the standalone uh, scarter is our warrant, and we can say something that qualifies um, our confidence in this characteristic. And we can also further code that characteristic based on the type of behavioral uh, variable. Um, now in Kairos, these factoids are called document, document uh, re 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 references. Um, so we might have a name. The external document is usually some sort of source that the factoid has, has actually come from. So in this case, the external document is from some form of quality of data analysis, hence the name GT concept. But it could equally be an inter interview to transcript day. Uh, we like to name the contributor so we know who actually came up with it in case we have questions. And the excerpt is the bit of text that the hack and indifference code actually came from. Um, so it could actually be some verb, so a few verbatim sentences from, from the source document itself so that someone can look at that, 
at that excerpt of text and basically look at the factoid and say, well, that kind of makes sense. Um, now, the persona characteristic itself which is our argument. We'll have a definition. It'll be specific to a persona, an environment variable, and we'll have a modal qualifier. And you can, as you can see, we can specify the grounds warrant and, and if necessary, um, the, the, the rebuttal. Don't worry too much about the GRL elements. That'll be the subject of another tutorial. Um, once we've added that, we can use the, um, the personas model in Keras to actually visualize the argumentation model itself. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's a quick way of spotting fallacies in decision making. So if we find that the text of the grounds of the warrant look a little bit unusual, it might be that people are deliberately fitting the, um, the data to fit some claim that's actually in the in the back of their head. So rather than actually analyzing the data and then coming up with some with some characteristic on that basis, they might just come up with the characteristic first and then try and um, hum, hum fit the grounds around it, which is a little bit overly subjective. Once we have these characteristics, what we can do then is actually create bit, bits of, of persona text. So in this case, we have our uh, the text that we, we had earlier, which we've written on the basis of the persona characteristic. Um, now, what we have in the Keras Keras repository is something called the persona helper. So it's not strictly part of Keras, but it's a Chrome extension that we created to make it easy to draw factoids from online d d d d data sources. Um, so before you use it, you need to right click on the on the sort of eye icon to connect to a Keras server and set the author. Of an, of an external source. But once, once we've done that, if we click, if we highlight some text and click on that button, we can actually add a factoid. And when we click on OK, that will create a new document reference in Kairos, which will look a, a, a little bit like that. Um, and not much more to say about that. The other nice thing about Kairos is because of this whole interoperability thing that we think is important with Kairos, it's we make it possible for you to export document references from Kairos into Trello. Now, Trello is really a project management tool, but it's designed as such that you can actually do online affinity diagramming because of the way Trello deals with lists and cards, which are key concepts in Trello, is a bit like um, affinity groups and, and, and factoids. So what we can do is actually export um, a whole bunch of our document references into Trello and actually group these. And what we might get is, 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 is something a little bit like this, where we have um, our groups that we, we've drawn and the cards are our factoids. And if we actually add a little bit more information, so if we annotate each of these cards to indicate whether it's a ground, which is green, or a warrant, which is blue, and we change the name of the list, so we have this colon att attitudes or colon aptitudes, where the thing after the colon is the name of behavioral variable, what we can do is we can then import this board into Kairos and automatically generate our um, our uh, our persona characteristics so something like so that example we talked about would lead to this being uh, generated um few words of warning though if you're going to export document references from kairos into trello every time you do that it's going to create a new board in the account of the person that's doing the export so if you export if you if you specify a board name which already exists, it's going to get overwritten. However, once that board exists in Trello itself, you can share that board with, with whoever you want. So you can do online affinity diagramming with people who are not just in the same room, but they could be in different cities, different different countries, uh, etc. So it makes affinity diagramming something that you can do uh, remotely rather than just in the same room with, with, with posted notes on a wall. I'll talk a little bit about tasks. Um, so these are the activities required to achieve a system goal. It's effectively the work that people need to do. And uh, as I men mentioned earlier, these are models as environment specific scenarios, but they're categorized by personas and usability at attributes. Now, the nice thing about tasks is number one, they actually put uh, personas in context. So if you're having a hard time writing a task that's really representative of the persona, maybe there's something wrong with the persona. The other thing they're good for 
is funding requirements need to be satisfied for the task to be completed successfully. So you may want to run a workshop with stakeholders where you, where you talk about how your personas do tasks and you get ideas about how the tasks should, uh, what need to be done for the task to be completed. And once you've done that, you can then ask people, okay, so what does our system need to do in, in order for this, to, for, for this task to happen? So requirements can be elicited on a bottom of basis with these tasks. Um, as we'll see, tasks can be associated with, with assets, and we won't talk about it in this tutorial, but they can be associated with the use cases as well. Um, so this is what, what a task looks like. You can create them from the US tasks, tasks menu. So they need a name, a short code, an author, an objective. But most of the properties of a task are going to be environment specific. So there's a narrative, which is our scenario. Um, we have also got um, the participants. And this will be categorized by name, duration, which might be minutes, hours, etc., frequency, which could be daily, weekly, uh, etc., uh, demands and goal conflict, which would be low, medium, or, or high. Now, in addition to that, we can say something about the consequence of the task, the benefits of, of, of the task, and, and the task task concerns. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, task task evaluation. So because we're entering information about personas, duration, frequency, demands, and goal conflict, we can do a little bit of a sort of high level evaluation. Now, if we think about what usability is, um, usability is this extent to which a product can be used by specific users to achieve goals regarding effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in the context of use. Um, now, the values that we use in carriage for duration, frequency, demands, goal, conflicts map onto these ISO 924 components quite nicely. So if we imagine then that each of these properties could be, uh, could be variables between 0, 0 and 3, uh, what we can do is come up with a fairly simple um, task usability for formula where a plus b divided by 2 is really the, um, this, these are the properties for uh, efficiency plus the properties for um, uh, effectiveness and satisfaction. So what we get is effectively a usability score. Now that bar means it means it, it's an average because you might actually have a task where you've got multiple personas uh, per, per, per participating. So the overall usability is based on all the, on the participation of all these, di all, all these di 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 different people. And the rule of thumb is that the higher the task, the less, the higher the number, the less usable the, 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 the task is. And we'll see how that's visualized uh, sh shortly. Now, what we would do is that once we once we've created a, a task a, a, a scenario, we would then say, okay, so here's our scenario. So how, how long does this take? How frequently would this be carried out? And if we, it's, it's information we can quickly get so we can get an initial score. So there's not, these scores aren't supposed to be precise. They're, they're meant to give you an indication uh, that can be useful um, later on, because usually when, when people people do this, they're not thinking of, they're not think, thinking about security. But if we link these to security design elements that we'll, 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 we'll see later, we can see the impact that security changes can have to these tasks. Um, as I've said, we can also link tasks to assets as well so using the using these con concerns concern links. And as you add tasks to Kairos, we can visualize them in, 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 the, in the task model. So here's a simple example. We've got our plant operator role. Uh, that's, a, that's an abstraction of our Rick persona, and Rick participates in this broken instrument alarm task. You can see that it, it's shaded blue. So that shade is based, that shading is based on the, on the usability score. And you can see that it's linked to this STCS uh, um, asset. So that's our concern link. And now as you start adding more information, we start adding risks, you can actually start seeing these red ellipses. So these red ellipses re represent um, misuse cases for, for risks. You can see the attacker that participates in that. And if we've got assets that are both uh, being threatened or could be exploited and they're used by task, we can visualize that on the, on the, on, on the, on the task model. So I've used these in, in workshops just to quickly go through the implications of things that people care about with 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 known security problems just to get people thinking about the implications a risk might actually have on the task uh, we've, we've got risk models that do that as well but risk models can get quite messy these tasks have comparatively fewer um model model elements on them